Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Ascension Parish Library, I thank you all for joining us for Days Gone By, a look at Donaldsonville's past. Your mics have all been muted to avoid background noise. I am pleased to present today's guest speaker to you, Mr. Sidney Marshawn III. Mr. Marshawn was born and raised in Donaldsonville. He is the grandson of Sidney Marshawn Sr., local historian, mayor, attorney, and author of the well-known collection of books at the Donaldsonville Library and at the Gonzales Library on Donaldsonville's history. Please welcome me and jo please join me in welcoming, this, welcoming Mr. Sidney Marshawn. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here today mainly because I've lived here all my life and because my grandfather was a well-known historian. And I'm not a historian. This is not meant to be a history lesson. This is not a study. Uh, it's one man's perspective. It's what I've seen or what I remember. And I'm going to try to highlight some of the uh, things I remember and how they may have changed over the years. Uh, we hope to have a, a photo presentation. Again, the photographs are not unique. Uh, many people have probably seen these before. Uh, what I'm going to tell you, old people who have been around here know. They may tell me that I'm wrong, that my, uh, that my memory is defective. But young people may find that this is interesting because the things that I'll point out have not always been here <clears throat> or were here at one time and are gone now. So this uh, presentation focuses mainly from 1990 when the Ascension Parish Library uh, was opened. And this is, I believe, a celebration of 60 years of the library. When that library was opened, or prior to that library being opened, people had access to some private libraries, even though those were limited. The high schools and the elementary schools, both public and the Catholic schools here had uh, libraries. The high school, Donaldsonville High School Library was pretty extensive. Catholic High School had a nice library too. Uh, but when the library opened here, it was open for general use. And uh, it was on Railroad Avenue, if I recall correctly, in a, uh, what had formerly been a five and dime store. It was uh, heavily used at that time as it is now. And of course the library is, has now moved into its, I'll call them new quarters. They've probably been there 20 years, but it's a new building and a beautiful building on Mississippi Street. How the Ascension Parish Library uh, became, came to be, I don't know. And that's another subject for someone else. If you were coming to Donaldsonville in 1960, you would approach it and you'd arrive here differently, in some cases differently than you do today. For example, Highway 31, uh, 3089, Marshawn Drive, uh, did not exist until around 1970. In 1960, you had a ferry that crossed right here at the head of Lesage Street and over mm. to Darrow. The Darrow community and that area of East Ascension was, uh, was closely connected to Donaldsonville in those days. The kids all went to school here, both in the public schools and the, the Catholic school. People did trade here. They bought their cars here. They, uh, they bought clothing. All sorts of trade uh, went on. And Donisonville, and that, went, that covered the Dara area, most of the Burnside area, and all the way going up into Geisman. When the ferry uh, was discontinued in about 1963, soon after the Sunshine Bridge was finished, then that connection with Darrow ceased. And if you wanted to come to Donaldsonville from Darrow or vice versa after then, you had to make that long 15 or 20 mile trek from Darrow down to the bridge and all the way up here. So that was a, a, that's a big difference. 
I have a photograph that will go a little later uh, of one of the old ferries. It was the George Prince. Everybody remembers that ferry, which was probably here for 30 or 40 years. Uh, the, the other ferry, remember by name, was the Ali K. Wild. How long the Ali K. Wild was here, I don't know, but it seemed to be the backup ferry and was tied to the bank most of the time. You, in 1960, to get to Donaldsonville from the New Orleans direction, you had to come all the way along Highway 18, the River Road, from St. James up through Lemonville, around Point Homeless, and up the River Road to Donaldsonville. When the Sunshine Bridge was opened in 1962, there were no connecting roads. So people would have to when they reached the bottom of the bridge on the west side, would have to turn around, go back to Highway 18 and follow the river road into Donaldsonville. Uh, the next step was a connector road, which went up to the Riverdale Golf Course, which was just about a mile from the bridge. And then that connector road went to the Highway 18, the river road, and you'd have to take the river road up here. In about 1970, the final connection was made when uh, that, uh, which extended all the way to Donaldsonville. How did you get here? Well, of course you got here by car, but you also got here by ferry boat and by train. In 1960, you had a, the uh, Texas and Pacific Railroad had a passenger service and it was heavily used. People going mainly to New Orleans, but sometimes to points uh, north and west. Uh, but that was discontinued, and I think sometime in the in the late 70s, I'm not certain of the date. People also would arrive here by bus. Uh, Mrs. Nizo had a, a Gulf service station at the corner of what's now Charles and Railroad Avenue. That was actually Highway State Highway 22 during those days, and Highway 22 extended from. Darrow across the ferry, down Lasard Street, Charles Street, where you'd have the bus station at Mississippi Street, and then on connecting to Albert Street, which took you, took you to Highway 1 to Napoleonville and White Castle. Uh, the bus service was heavily used also for people going up and down the river and, and uh, points north and west. People, it was an active uh, I call it a jitney service. It was either small buses or uh, taxis uh, that uh, were used by many people in the area in those days. Many people didn't have cars. So the jitney service had a lot of business. In 1960, most households had one car at most. And it's only been in, in the last, I say only, the last 30 or 40 or 50 years that households expanded with two or more cars. I've prepared a, a sketch and it's a takeoff on a map. And what I wanna do is just show you some of the extensions of the town that have occurred since 1960. And in 1960, the, the town itself comprised only this area, going, I call it into Churchville, here back to the bayou. That's, that was the original city of Donaldsonville, plus, plus the Lasard property, plus the church property, which was the property of the Ascension Catholic Church, which was up on the front, but it extended all the way down here. And then you have the limit addition, which was added in about 1910. Down here, you had property that was owned by the Fair Association, and that was annexed to the city sometime in the late 60s. There a few homes there. Port Barrow, which is the large area west of the bayou and north of, high, of, north of the railroad track, had been developed from the 1890s, but it had never been annexed into the city until 1969 or thereabouts. And at that time, a sewer system was built there. A sewer system on, a, uh, on a, an area that big 
and that densely populated is a big project. It was a very, very progressive move, but it was controversial because it was very expensive. And the homeowners were assessed, each lot owner was assessed with a certain amount of money to pay for that sewer. And believe me, when I came in, back to Donaldsonville from uh, university and law school in 1971, there was still a lot of controversy going on here about paying those, those sewer assessments. The smoke bin area was not in the city and that was annexed at a later date. And I would say that was sometime in the seventies, but not sure. Now, this area, which is west of Bayou Lafourche and on and um, south of the railroad tracks was not annexed into the city until sometime in the late 1960s. That includes the Savoy subdivision, also, the Bun Hood subdivision at the very uh, bottom here, which was developed by Jack Hood and Olin Bun in the 50s. That was considered when I was a, a teenager to be a high rent area. Rich people lived there. That was populated by a lot of people that came in with a Conoco Oil Company that was working the Atchafalaya oil fields. Then you had a later addition where Walmart, the Walmart area was annexed, and that must have been in the early 80s. The areas down here, south of town on the west, on the east side of the bayou, uh, had a bunch of subdivisions that were brought in in the late 1960s. You had the uh, Catadonna subdivision, which were properties, I believe, of the Cataldo and Bonadonna families. You had the Sotillo subdivision, you had various uh, lots, and you might have noticed this line, the people in this area did not want their cane fields to be in the city, so they were excluded. Uh, but the home properties in the front were, this is the Crescent, the Acadian Gardens uh, subdivision of Joe Calandro in the 1990s, excuse me, 1960s, and Prevo Memorial Hospital is located on that track. And then you have the Crescent Place subdivision and the Bocage Place subdivision, which was developed by Vincent Sotil, uh, Jack Hood, Willard Cazzo, and A.J. Semino. Next came the Reno subdivision, owned by the Reno uh, family. This particular uh, subdivision is Crescent Place. That was named after the Crescent Plantation, large plantation here at Sugarcane, owned by the Reno family. And since then, the Reno's have added on down here several different times additional properties. So that's the general way that the, the city uh, has developed over that time from 1960 to this day. Now, the the population of the city from 1960 uh, to now hasn't varied too much. The, there were several segments of the community that have changed. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about maybe the cultural or ethnic uh, aspects. When I, when I was a child and in 1960, I was 13 years old, there was a lot of French spoken in Donaldsonville. For example, my mother, who was the youngest of 12, was reared in English, but her older six children, uh, six siblings, were all reared in French. That was their primary language. So along the streets of Donaldsonville, you'd hear a lot of uh, French spoken. My grandfather spoke uh, French English. He also learned Spanish because Spanish was the, uh, the language of many of the Brulis, Bruli Sacramento, Bruli Ruiz, Bruley Capit, Bruley Cassad, Bruley McCall, all those had many Spanish families and there were several thousand people living uh, there in those days, Canary Islanders. Uh, I don't remember too much of that Spanish being uh, spoken, but people tell me it was. We had a fairly large Jewish population here in 1960. And there are very few, if any, Jewish uh, folks living here now. There was a synagogue then. There's a, a large regional Jewish cemetery situated here. 
on land that was donated to the Jews by the Catholic Church on that church property that we've talked about before. Um, there was a large segment of uh, black folks then and now, and uh, there was a, a large group of Italians, mainly Sicilians, but also some Calabrises, as they called from the province of Calabria. And of course, there are many uh, Sicilians still here. There was a, a substantial Lebanese uh, population that uh, had uh, merchant stores up and down Railroad Avenue, and uh, many of the families are still here today. Yet a few Germans, uh, but not too many. And now after 1956, you had a pretty good influx of Cubans. Uh, after Fidel Castro uh, took over Cuba, many of the, the uh, people were persona non grata and had to get out of Cuba. Many were in the sugar business. So they ended up here in the late 60s, uh, mid 60s, uh, working at the sugar mills as sugar engineers, uh, sugar technicians, highly skilled people. There were also some uh, civil and mechanical engineers in this area that were Cubans and a, a number of doctor, medical doctors. So uh, we, we don't see them much anymore here, but uh, they were here right after the, the 60s. There were a number of Polish people, families here that uh, came here after World War uh, II, uh, mainly escaping uh, the conditions in Europe at the time. And they, many of them were hired on to uh, work on the sugarcane plantations, but soon uh, went into their own businesses and uh, prospered over the years. And many of those families are still here. There were a few Mexican families uh, at that time uh, that had migrated up here, mainly working on the Texas and Pacific Railroad. But they uh, intermarried uh, into local families, and many of those families are, are still here also. With this mix of, of uh, people here, I am told that Donaldsonville has a peculiar accent. I don't know if that's true, but about five years ago, I was talking to a, a, a lady lawyer in Houston. I'd never met her before, but I spoke to her four or five times. And then she called me a month later and said something unusual happened. She was in South Mexico at a resort and she heard some people speaking. And she said, I've never heard that accent except one time. So she went to the folks and asked them, what, from where are you? And they said, we're from Donaldsonville, Louisiana. And she, this woman from Houston said, she picked that accent up and said, she had never heard anything like it. And I always tell people it's a mix of standard English, Cajun, redneck, black, Italian, and Spanish, kind of jumbled all together. My children who now live in Texas tell me uh, the same thing. What uh, the religious mixes of folks in this area are probably pretty much the same. Uh, there were many Catholic, Roman Catholics in this area in 1960, and there are many uh, now. The black Catholics had a separate church, St. Catherine of Siena, and there was a separate uh, school the, uh, run by the, the Sisters of the Holy Family, and the church was uh, manned by the Josephite priests out of Baltimore, Maryland. I don't know if the Josephites are still there, and the Holy Family Sisters uh, don't run that school anymore. That school was merged with Ascension Catholic sometime in the 1970s, perhaps. The Catholicism I remember in the 60s was a strict, gloomy Catholicism. Uh, when Lent came around, music went off, TV went off, you went on the strict uh, diets of, the, uh, of fasting and abstinence. Uh, many of those traditions have loosened over the years. Uh, again, this is one man's perspective, and I tell it from my perspective and that of my family. And so other people, no doubt, have different experiences, but this is mine. The, a big thing that happened in the 1960s was the civil rights movement 
civil rights movement and the integration of public facilities and schools. And that had a profound change uh, for the better, no doubt. And, uh, but it was a big, big change. Uh, when I was a child, do I, did I notice it? Probably not much because I was a white boy and uh, I was not segregated. But uh, that was a big, big change. That was a movement that started, I noticed it mostly in the late, excuse me, the mid 60s. And of course the integration of the schools here occurred, I believe in around 1969. By that time I was at LSU, so I couldn't tell you too many personal experiences about that. Uh, was the 1960 library segregated? I would assume so, but uh, somebody else would have to speak to that. The 1960s, 1960 was only 14, uh, excuse me, 15 years after the end of World War II. There was a huge presence of military, veterans, uh, the celebrations of uh, all of the different um, uh, Memorial Day, the, uh, the, the end of World War II, D-Day, all of those were celebrated by hundreds and hundreds of people. There were parades uh, several times a year with fully uh, dressed military veterans in the hundreds. Uh, you could not be, you could not serve in politics unless pretty much you had a good veterans record. And many hundreds of Donaldsonville men, boys, uh, went to war and, and uh, many were killed. So that was a, a huge influence during that time. As we see in, in the year 2020, the membership of the American Legion, the veterans of foreign wars, uh, that has greatly diminished because you don't have that presence of World War II veterans here as uh, throughout the, the nation. Uh, Vietnam was a, a, uh, a war, but it did not have the same uh, acclaim that uh, the victors of World War II uh, had. Uh, so the, the World War of uh, Vietnam, as everybody knows, except the young kids may not know, was a war that really developed in the late 1960s and um, ended in the early 1970s. There were a number of boys here that were killed in World War in, a, in the Vietnam War. Politics. I was always aware of politics. My uh, grandfather, my father were, uh, were elected officials, and my grandfather, who lived to be an old man, died in 1972, was always involved in politics. He would support candidates actively. He would uh, go to the polls on election day and they tell me he'd take a seat there and he'd have a sheet and he'd mark down who voted and try to predict how they would vote. He did this for many years. The, the method of, of uh, campaigning during those days was much different. In the 1960s, uh, there were huge rallies, many of them held on the front steps of the courthouse. The, uh, the speakers would sit, would stand on a, or sit on a podium right at the front door, and there were several hundred cars that would occupy the parking lot. And as a speaker would get up there and make a, a, a point that they approved of, people would blow the horns and clap, and it was a, a, a big celebration. It was a big occasion. Now, some of the first, my first memories in the, in the, six, in the late uh, 50s of rallies were uh, you had uh, Governor Earl K. Long came to speak there one time, and uh, my grandfather paraded all of his grandchildren right to the front row so that we could get a, a glimpse of Earl K. Long. And the speakers would, uh, would start. Uh, the mayor of Independence came, and he gave a speech in Italian. And the Italian people uh, understood that, and they would uh, applaud. Uh, then you had one or two French speakers. They'd get up there and the people that understood French would clap and, and applaud. And then you'd have the, uh, the majority of it was in English, but you still had that big influence. Nowadays, as I've remarked earlier, uh, you, you don't hear French spoken here much, and I don't think you hear much Italian 
uh, spoken much. The 1960 election was a big deal. That was the election for president. You had John F. Kennedy running against Richard Nixon. John F. Kennedy was a Catholic. They had never been a Catholic elected president uh, before. And the, of course, being a Catholic town, uh, there was a heavy support for John Kennedy here. People just were very, very enthusiastic about it. And when he got elected, there was a, there was a, a lot of joy in this town. Uh, my grandfather was so excited about that election, he dragged all of his grandchildren on the Texas and Pacific Railroad and Railroad and took us up to Washington, D.C. for the inauguration. It was a big, big deal for the people here. In 1964, you had Lyndon Johnson, the Texan, running against Lyndon, I mean, against uh, Barry Goldwater. And uh, even though he was a Texan, he didn't have quite the uh, cachet that uh, John Kennedy had. In those days, Donisonville was all Democrats. You only had three Republicans, and I knew all of them, and we would, we would always chastise all of them. I'm not going to mention their names right now. Uh, some of the people in this audience would know them, but if you wanted to be in politics, you had to be a Democrat, and that's changed so, so much nowadays, especially uh, as Ascension Parish as a whole uh, is. In 19, prior to 1980 or thereabouts, the city of Donisonville operated under a standard commission form of government, which was a form that is prescribed by state law. Uh, under that form, the mayor is part-time, and in around 1980, the, uh, the voters of Donaldsonville approved a special home rule charter, uh, which allowed for a full-time mayor and a full-time mayor was soon elected. The congressional uh, districts in 1990, uh, 1960 were much different than now, but they do have some similarities. In 1960, you had a gerrymandered district which extended all the way from Gina above uh, Alexandria, coming all the way down to Donaldsonville. That's about 150 miles or so, maybe a little more. Uh, that snaked all over where the politicians in that time, I think it was Speedy Long was the congressman and later Gillis Long. And that's the way they wanted uh, the district form. They thought, it favored them. Now we have a gerrymandered district which extends from New Orleans, snakes along the river, picks up Donaldsonville, and extends into the uh, East Baton Rouge Parish. And I believe Cedric Richmond has been the congressman there for a long time. And uh, apparently that's the way he likes the district too. Just as a side note, but it's of interest, we do have the uh, Chief D Justice of the Louisiana Supreme Court, Bernadette Joshua Johnson, uh, was reared partly in Lemonville, uh, Ascension Parish, Louisiana. Her mother is a member of the Wire family and her father a member of the Joshua family from that area. What businesses existed in 1960 that don't exist now, or what businesses exist now that didn't exist then. One that I, I remember was the cigar factory. When I remember the cigar factory, it was first located uh, in a building, a wooden building with, next to the courthouse, which had previously been an armory or a uh, fire department headquarters of some type. Now this cigar industry was a big industry. It hired maybe a hundred people in there rolling cigars by hand. Uh, during the 60s, it moved to where the American Legion home is now on Mississippi Street or Veterans Drive. And it was run by the Trellis family out of Cuba and New Orleans. They, uh, they rolled uh, a particular cigar named El Trellis and I believe they made the keep moving cigar. 
So my old grandfather always had a pocket full of either L trailers or keep moving, and he'd hand them out to anybody he'd see, men, women, didn't matter. He was going to hand you a keep moving or an L trailers. And that business uh, died out, I guess, in around 1960 or soon thereafter. In 1960, you had five or six different automobile dealerships here. You had a Ford, Chevrolet, Oldsmobile, Studebaker, Plymouth, Pontiac. You had uh, the, the Ford dealership was Tubby Ewan. The Chevrolet was the Thibault family. The Lemons had Oldsmobile. Roy Ennis had Plymouth. The Matassa family had the Studebaker. The Capones had Pontiac. And I believe there was a GMC dealership, but that might have been with either the Tebos or the Lemons with their other vehicles. There are no dealerships here now anymore. Uh, in those days, it was rare to see a foreign car. There might have been a few Volkswagens around, but very, very few. You didn't see Toyotas, Hondas, uh, Nissans. That did not exist, and you didn't. There were certainly no BMWs, maybe one or two Mercedes of, of people I knew, but very, very few. Now, you did have uh, one of the doctors here had a Maserati, which all the teenage boys would really watch that one closely. And uh, you had a, a man here had a brand new Rolls Royce, and uh, everybody took note of that. The clothing stores. There were, there were multiple clothing stores uh, in the downtown area of Donaldsonville. There was the Block or Hirsch stores that was called Dave's Shop and later Gaston's, and that was men's and women's, a fairly high quality. You had the Lemons department store that had men's and women's clothing, a fairly high quality. You had Mary's Dress Shop, which had, uh, from what I'm told, had very nice women's clothes. You had uh, Wiles Department Store. You had the Modern Shoe Store. You had um, uh, Vincent Matassa's Avenue Bargain Store. You had the Shaheen uh, Store. You had the Barry's Department Store. All these uh, were uh, heavily patronized and did a, a real good business. I'll go on for reasons why some of that changed in a minute, but that's part of the commercial uh, change in, in this area. You had a lumber mill in 1960 operating um, in the Churchville area. Some people call it back of, back of town or back of town. And uh, that hired a number of people. That was a big business. That faded out sometime in the 1960s also. I'm gonna show you some pictures in a little while. And uh, in 1960, there was a, a, a big fishing group out, a commercial fishing group at the area where the railroad tracks crossed by Lafourche and where Highway 1 crossed by Lafourche. These were uh, mainly catching shad or sardine, which migrated all the way up from the Gulf of Mexico. That ended sometime in the late 60s when a dam was put in Thibodeau which I'm told blocked that flow. And so you didn't see, but at that time you had, uh, you had people would use these sands, big uh, cross by your nets to catch shrimp, shad, and people were in boats, several different boats all day and half the night right there catching fish. The corner groceries in Donaldsonville, of course, existed. Uh, many of those were operated by the Sicilian, uh, people of Sicilian origin, and uh, there were the Jambronis, the Bolinas. Bolina still has their store. The Graffios, and I could go on and on and on. Uh, they were at every corner, almost every corner in Donaldsonville and in the area south of the track also. You had several banks. You had uh, the First National Bank, you had the Donaldsonville State Bank, and you had the Ascension Savings and Loan. Uh, the first three have gone by the wayside, were absorbed, uh, excuse me, First National Bank was absorbed by the uh, Whitney National Bank, which is now Hancock Whitney and now exists, 
but it's out on Marchion Drive. Uh, Donisonville State Bank was absorbed by Hibernia, then by Regions, and uh, then by Capital One, which closed that branch just not in the, in the last few years. First American Bank has, a, um, has established its bank uh, branch here, and that's First American from Vachery. Uh, in a, maybe uh, the year 2005, uh, I could be corrected, but it's been there a while, out on Marshall Drive, and they do a, a very good uh, banking business. Now, the 1960, you had a large sugar mill here, which was the Evan Hall Sugar Co-op up at uh, McCall. You had quite a number of people from Donaldsonville that worked here. Uh, that sugar house closed maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And um, it's a trend in the industry where these mills were consolidated and Evan Hall was one of the casualties. In 1960, you had a good deal of oil production from this area. There was the Lapeace field in St. James. There was the White Castle field, which was really back of White Castle. And then you had the Darrow field, which was Exxon. Lapeace and White Castle was Shell production fields. So Shell Oil Company at that time had a, uh, its regional office situated here, a one, uh, one floor above the State Bank building, the other floor occupied above the Lemons, which now Lemons Farm Supply. So they had, I'm told, 70 or so people working in that office. You had uh, Shell actually built a small subdivision, which is an extension of Lemon Edition on this map, uh, which was actually this area here is what we call the Shell Edition. It was about four blocks of homes there that were mainly occupied by the people who worked for Shell Oil Company. And you had several spin-off uh, industries from the oil industry. You had uh, General Mudd, which was the, uh, the uh, Leo Cafera and Herman Cafera family uh, trucking company. And, and uh, they had a branch which provided mud, drilling mud to the, the, the uh, production facilities. That became General Mud over the years, uh, owned by P.J. Latour and Bill Dupre and by the Cafera family. They actually had a little small oil refinery up in Smoke Bend and um, run by Luther McAllister and his associates. As the oil production in those fields uh, declined, those the shell offices eventually left and uh, the, the fields are greatly reduced now. The Donaldsonville chief in those years was a big business. I say a big business. They may have hired 10 or 15 people because you had people in the sales office in the front. They had an office supply store. In the back, you had the actual printing of the newspaper and other commercial printing. And you had linotype operators. You had uh, people who carried the paper around. You had various helpers. I worked there a little while as a teenager and there were a number of people working there. You had, uh, in the sugarcane industry, you had an, actually a crop dusting operation uh, situated down at Air Farm, that um, was uh, on the Palo Alto plantation, and uh, that business just closed in the last few years. There was a change in the method of applying agricultural chemicals. Businesses that, of course, were not here then were uh, the large industries that we have right next to the town of Donaldsonville is located CF Industries. And uh, in that complex, you had uh, Mississippi Chemical and Triad Chemical, which uh, just closed and were more or less absorbed into the CS, CF footprint uh, in the last few years. In 1956, the first industry in Ascension Parish was constructed. That was the Ormet plant at Burnside, and then from there, you quickly had uh, several plants that uh, were constructed in the Geisma area. I worked construction up in the Geisma area in uh, summers in the uh, 60s, and there were several uh, plants 
downstream that were built. The Gulf plant, which is now Chevron and Mosaic and American Styrenics, in, right down at the St. James line. And of course, you had uh, that changed the complexion of Donaldsonville and of the whole parish tremendously. In about 1970, the stevedoring and uh, the, the fleeting of vessels and, and uh, barges started in this area. In 1970, LNL Fleeting and the Levy Group out of New Orleans uh, set up a ship mooring area right here at Dara. And that was run by, uh, in part by a guy named Casey Collins. Casey Collins eventually uh, uh, sold out to the larger Cooper Stevedoring. And that industry, as we know today and since around that time, has hired several hundred people. It's, uh, if you get up on the levee in Donaldsonville and look across the river, you see barges extending for several miles upstream and downstream. And on, on most occasions, you'll see several ocean going ships there. Uh, then you had the American Commercial Barge Line established a fleet, which they accessed at the, uh, at the, uh, the head of St. Patrick Street on the Cokie property. And there's still off and on for the last 30 or 40 years, there's been a fleet there. Uh, these uh, businesses uh, provide significant employment for this area. Upriver, you've got some barge fleeting and, uh, and barge cleaning and repair operations, one of whom uh, TT Barge Company has its headquarters here in Donaldsonville and just built a very nice facility on Railroad Avenue in the last year or so. The railroad in 1960 and no more now had a, a large depot or terminal here. Passengers would board and alight from the terminal, the, the depot several times a day from the passenger trains and also there was a large amount of freight that was shipped uh, from there. I can remember as a, a teenager riding up there on my bicycle up on the, the platform and that you'd see uh, large cases of fish, you'd see the ice dripping, you'd see uh, cases of uh, uh, shipments of honey coming from the Best Net Bee Company. Also, it seemed to me that there would be ship shipments of bee live bees coming in and out uh, for those industries. Of course, that doesn't exist now. Now, why did Donaldsonville, why has it changed? Well, over the years, there have been significant uh, physical access changes to Donaldsonville and to the area that made a big difference. As I mentioned, the Sunshine Bridge was built in around and opened in around 1962 or 63. That terminated the ferry use and terminated the trade and the commerce and the activity that came from Darrow, Burnside and Geisler. The bridge also provided uh, easier access for Donaldsonville shoppers to go to Baton Rouge and New Orleans. And so there was, uh, you started to see the decline of some of the retail trades at that time. And again, these are my personal observations, but I think they're correct. Then one thing that happened, and I don't know if this had much bearing, but the, this was a Catholic town and it was associated with the Diocese of New Orleans. When that changed and it, the Diocese of Baton Rouge was formed in the late 60s or early 70s, then there was a shift in the religious traffic from New Orleans to Baton Rouge. Uh, if anything, that uh, helped the uh, helped to cut the ties with New Orleans. The airline highway had existed from Baton Rouge to New Orleans from the 1930s, and so you had a connection there to get to Baton Rouge and New Orleans. But when the interstate highway was opened in around 1972, and you connected that with the Sunshine Bridge, that was a direct conduit, a very rapid. Uh, trip from Donaldsonville to downtown Baton Rouge or to the shopping centers in Baton Rouge and to the shopping centers in Metairie and in New Orleans. And that I think accelerated the uh, decline of the commercial activity. Walmart 
came into Donaldsonville around 1950, and I think it is documented that uh, Walmart uh, at that time caused the, uh, the end of 15 to 20 mom and pop type businesses, clothing stores, uh, hardware stores, all, all of that type of business was absorbed by Walmart. Uh, that's not to me, uh, meant to be a criticism of Walmart, which certainly offers uh, advantages, but it is, I think it's a fact that th that phenomena happened here as it did in many other places. The industries, as I've mentioned before, had a, uh, a profound effect and uh, for the most part provided uh, much higher paying jobs than were available before. But those industries to some extent were located on the east bank of the river. And so much of the population of, of Donaldsonville moved to the East Bank. As we all know, there are many subdivisions on the East Bank uh, in which I know 15 to 20 families each in those subdivisions that were originally from Donaldsonville. And so those are some of the reasons that I perceive as the change. What are some of the physical changes to the town that, that I might not have mentioned? Some of these are insignificant, but I'm going to mention them and see if you find them of any interest. The railroad crossing over uh, Via Lafourche was until around 2017, a, an earthen dam with two, rel two or three or four relatively small culverts underneath. Uh, that, was that earthen dam was removed in around 2017. Now it's a free flow and it allows for much more flow from the Mississippi River with the larger pumps that are installed and to be installed to provide much more water flow down to the Lafourche and Terrebonne area. Mm -hmm. The bayou was dredged in about 2010, which changed the uh, width of the bayou, made it deeper and wider and the current uh, faster. In around in 1960s, and uh, it was significant to me, it may not be to anyone else, but there were several large, what we called flume ditches. Those were ditches, and the one that I remember most uh, was between the, it was on the Pettivant Plantation coming off of Highway 18. It was where water was pumped from Mississippi River into the ponds behind the levee and then pumped over the levee down the flume ditch to supply rice fields that were on the so south side of the town. Now, as the rice industry in this area declined, the need for the flume ditch uh, declined. But it was, a, uh, it was significant because there was a lot of water in those ponds behind the levee in those days. Now they're not, now they're not existent, but in those days they were, they were full, they were full of fresh river water. They were great swimming holes. Uh, the, the sediment would, would fall to the bottom at some points and you'd get fairly clear water. So it was a, a real nice recreational area for the teenagers in this area of, of my day. Uh, the, a big change that people would not notice until around, the, until the late 60s when the sewer system was revamped, Donaldsonville uh, pumped untreated raw sewage into the Mississippi River, direct drive in a pipe over the Mississippi River levee down here near the south part of town. And uh, as the, the uh, need for environmental cleanup increased here and in the nation, the sewer system uh, had to be revamped. It was revamped. And there were large uh, settlement ponds, oxidation ponds that were uh, constructed south of town and the pipe in the river taken, out, uh, taken away. And as you can, you, you might imagine, that was a significant change. Uh, I'm told that existed all the way up and down the Mississippi River and probably in every lake and river in the nation. So that's a, that was a big change. In 1969, the whole Port Barrow area of Donaldsonville, which had two or three or 4,000 people, never had sanitary sewer systems before. So that was constructed and that was the big project that I've described before. You had a number of ponds uh, surrounding the, the town that were noteworthy. You had the ponds behind the levee, 
which are dry now. You had ponds out on the, the uh, east. Did we lose connection? <laughs> the exhibit's on, but I'm on also. Uh, as I was saying, I, I believe we, our connection was was uh, was terminated. But in 1960, you had three television channels that were received here. You had WAFB, you had WBRZ, both from Baton Rouge, and you had WDSU from New Orleans. That was it. There was no cable. There were no other channels. And maybe there was uh, later on. There was a uh, a different frequency, channel 33. But those were the, the only channels. Nowadays, of course, you can get a thousand channels on your cable set work, network or your satellite if you want it. Uh, most families had one car. Uh, you were lucky to have a phonograph in your house. There was certainly no computer. And that's probably typical throughout, throughout the nation. In those days, you had two movie theaters here. You had the Grand Theater, uh, and that was mainly for the white people, but the, it was segregated. Uh, black folks had to sit up in the balcony. Now, the, the, there was another theater, the Harlem Theater on Lasard Street, which was mainly patronized by the black families. <clears throat> From time to time, uh, and, and this is a cultural difference and a change, nowadays you see so much violence going on among uh, uh, teenagers or young people fighting. In those days, in the 60s, there were fights, but there were never any knives, any guns that I can remember. There, was, uh, there were fisticuffs and there would be winners and losers, but after that, uh, there was nobody seriously hurt. Looks like that has changed. And uh, that's something that's nationwide. In the 60s, polio was a scourge and the Salk vaccine had just been, uh, had been invented. And there were many, many children here who, who had polio. Some of them were severely dis disabled. I don't know any that died, but there were, there were many families that suffered uh, that scourge. Uh, that is no longer the case, and you rarely, if ever, hear of anyone uh, having polio. Thank, thank goodness. The doctors had three hospitals. You had Dr. LeBlanc had his private hospital, Dr. Shexnada had a private hospital, and Dr. Falls had a private hospital. Prevo Hospital did not exist until the late 60s, uh, when it was built, those doctors closed their private hospitals and uh, uh, started to practice uh, their hospital work at Prevo, which has been a wonderful boon to the community. And it's valuable to this day. The Lemon Center, where many activities are, are held, was conducted, was built in around 1975 on land donated by the Lemon family. And um, the new baseball fields, I call them new, the baseball fields that are there were built in around 1975. 
and uh, they're still heavily used to this date. Before, that was a golf course in the 50s, a three-hole golf course, and then where the main grandstands are was an old wooden grandstand. It was a very large grandstand, but it's, it's uh, different from the one today. So I am now, I believe, running out of time. Is that about right? And I was asked to reserve some time for questions. Excuse me, I'm going to show the pictures. Okay, well, let's go to the pictures. I'll just go run through them if we have time. Mm -hmm. The first is a, uh, this is a pre-1888 map, which shows the, and you can see where Bayou Lafourche hits the bayou, and it shows the contour of the town. Now, you'll note that Port Barrow, which was not annexed into the, the town until 1969, existed pre-1888. Pre let's go to the next one, please. This is a map from 1888, which shows that the railroad had just come. It also shows Port Barrow, which was not annexed till much later. Next. This is a ferry of the type that was used on Bayou Lafourche to cross before you had uh, bridges and highways going across. Next. This was from 1936, which was a construction of Highway 1 going um, under the railroad tracks. So that, that still exists today. This is the swimming pool that was located on Mississippi Street until about 1962, when the new pool was built out on Clay Street. Next. Uh, this is an old scene, but I put it on there because it shows the, the, the riverfront activity in the early 1900s, and you again have that, river, that great riverfront activity at this time. Next. Uh, this is just a 1937 scene of, of Donaldsonville, the corner of, real, of the corner of Mississippi Street and Lasard Street, and it's much the same except one building, the Tebow Motor Company building, uh, is was replaced with a new Tebow Motor Company building. Now this is the sewer being constructed in 1936 in the main part of Donaldsonville. I only bring that up to highlight the huge construction that was done in 1969 in Port Barrow. This is a scene from the South Louisiana State Fair, which was a huge production in 1960, and uh, it still exists in a diminished form today, but uh, its heyday, I would think, were in the, in the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s. This is just an old scene from Railroad Avenue, uh, 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 Railroad Avenue, and uh, it's somewhat changed from today, yes. This is a scene along uh, Railroad Avenue. Uh, several of those buildings still exist today, but the one to the extreme left is gone. Next. This is the old City Hall and Firehouse, which lasted until the new one was built in the 1970s. This is just an old fire, fire truck used until the 1960s. This is the Armory building, which I believe was later used as a cigar factory. It's next, it was next to the courthouse. This is a scene from the South Louisiana State Fair, and it's being held in the old grandstands at the South Louisiana Fair grandstand. This is a, a scene from uh, Bayou Lafourche, near where the pumps are in Donaldsonville. This comes, uh, this photo is dated in the late 50s, soon after the pumps, uh, the new, the pumps were opened. Bayou Lafourche had been dammed from the Mississippi River from around 1905 until uh, the, the mid 50s. And this is the way it looked after it was, the pumps were started again. This is the St. Joseph's Commercial Institute. This was the Catholic school for boys, which existed until it was torn down sometime in the late 70s. This is the, George, the deck of the George Prince, the ferry crossing the Mississippi River here for many years at Donaldsonville. This is a hatchery. This was a business that was located on Highway 1 
in Port Barrow, which uh, raised chickens and uh, sold them nationwide. These, this is a crew at the sawmill, which I've described before. And as you can see, it had a large group of men working there. This is, the, the, this is during the construction of the Sunshine Bridge in about 1962. The lady in there is Joan Grisafi, uh, uh, Joan Giat Grisafi. Now these are the fishermen at, uh, on Bay Lafourche at the crossing of, of the highway, and you can see their boats full of uh, shad. The next is another group of those same men fishing at the highway crossing. And I see on that, uh, in that photograph, it shows that the crossing was, uh, was constructed, it looks like 1964. This is just a scene from around 1972 when the governor visited Governor Edwards and you see Mayor Lala Ruggiero uh, walking along with him. This was just a big, big day for the city. This is the, the uh, rear, uh, rear uh, advertising board for the uh, Grand Theater. It was right behind the, the theater. This is the uh, demolition of the footbridge. This is the old Knights of Columbus home, which was located on Mississippi Street, uh, right across from where El Ray Cokie's business is. This building must have been demolished in the 1960s or 70s. It's just an unusual photograph in the 80s. Ice in the Mississippi River has no particular significance. So I, I've, I've hope you've enjoyed uh, some of the points that I've raised. And again, this is not a history. This is only my, uh, some of my observations and recollections. And thank you for allowing me to do this. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for attending today's program. We appreciate it. We hope you've learned a lot, and please tune in for more programs that we'll be having. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. <laughs>